God ourselves. Margot Adler, who's a, a, a kind of a religious a metaphysicist kind of person, said, we are as gods and might as well get good at it. In other words, you got to get better and better and better at being your own god. And then Maharashi Mahesh Yogi, that's, like, that's the guy's name, okay, or the lady's name, I'm not real sure. Maharashi Mahesh Yogi, she said, uh, she take in Psalm 46.10, completely reversing it, said, be still and know that you are God. Instead of be still and know that I am God from the mouth of Yahweh, be still and know that you are God. And so to our Christianized ears, these sound like blasphemy, right? And they are. They are blasphemous statements. But to a culture that's becoming more and more and more post-Christian, these are just one of many optional statements of truth that you could tack on to your life and begin living out. And so we understand that our culture is moving away from that and uh, people are rejecting the truth about Christ. But even in what most people would consider to be the Christian culture, there are still those who have rejected the truth about Christ. You know, we as, uh, as Bible-believing Christians who believe that the Scripture is the Scripture, that is the Word of God, that it is inerrant, that it never changes, uh, we believe what the Bible says about Jesus is true. But there are those in the Mormon, denom- Mormon faith and in the Jehovah's Witness faith that consider themselves Christians, but which believe something absolutely foreign to what the Bible says about Jesus. Uh, the Mormon, Mormon beliefs says that Jesus is the first of many, many, many spirit children uh, that were the offspring of a heavenly father and a heavenly mother, and that he was the first offspring, and the second one was Lucifer, was Satan. And that, so Jesus and Satan are are brothers, they're first and second brothers. And so that's what they believe about Jesus. The Jehovah's Witness believe that uh, Jesus as a man here on earth was the archangel Michael who took on flesh and became a man, and that he was one of the first creations, the early creations of God. And so they believe, even though they call themselves a Christian faith, their understanding of the truth about Jesus is something completely different. This is nothing that's new. Paul, writing to the Ephesian believers, said this. He said, We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. We were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. And so this is just something that comes naturally uh, as, as people who uh, are, have a sinful nature. We have a natural tendency to reject the message of Jesus. And that's exactly what this group that was around him that day was doing. Even though he had performed miracles and done amazing signs and was teaching them the truth, they were rejecting that truth that was coming from him. And they were picking up stones to try to kill Jesus. And so they had the, uh, the tendency to reject him. And so it's naturally to do that. And that's why Jesus continually, all throughout his ministry, He gave us reasons to believe in him. And that's your second point. But before we get there, I do want to address one thing that's here in this passage, okay? And so um, this is that first rabbit trail that we're we're going to go down today. And so before we get there to that second point in your your outline, look at verse 33, okay? Uh, Look at verse 33. In, In verse 33, the Pharisees accused Jesus of blasphemy, saying that he made himself out to be God. All right, so they, they pick up stones. They're going to try to stone him. Jesus says, for which one of my works are you trying to stone me? And they say, hey, it's not what you did. It's what you said. You being a man have made yourself to be God. Okay, and then Jesus says something that is really kind of, kind of odd. Okay, and so he says, isn't it written in your law? I said you are God's. If he called those whom the word of God came to God's and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say you are blaspheming to the one the Father set apart and sent into the world because I said I am the Son of God? All right, so by show of hands, how many of you have a very clear understanding of what Jesus just said right there? Okay? All right, so my six-year-old understands it. I don't know why the rest of you didn't raise your hand. He, rose, he raised his hand. No, we, that's, a, that's a really confusing thing going on right there, right? Jesus said, you said you were gods and, you know, how, you know, all this kind of stuff. Isn't it written, you know, that you says you are gods and everything? Well, what Jesus is doing there is he's got a play on words, okay? He's using the word Elohim, which is the Old Testament gen, kind of a generic term for a God that the, Pharise- the Jews used to refer to God. He's using that as a play on words, and we do this in our, in our English vernacular too sometimes, right? Uh, like take, for example, the word cool or the word hot, okay? And so 
you know, just imagine for a moment that, uh, you know, Boogie gets up, he, he puts on his hoodie, you know, it's kind of gotten cold outside, and so he puts on his hoodie, and he goes and checks the thermostat, and he's kind of cold, and so he, he goes over to Baker, and he says, hey, Baker, are you feeling a little cool? You know how Baker would respond? He would say, Dad, I'm always cool. I'm the coolest guy you've ever met, Right? Now, just to be clear, I asked Baker's permission before I embarrassed him this morning. And so, you know, Baker, he did a little play on words, right? Boogie's talking about the temperature in the room. Baker's talking about how everybody precedes him as a cool guy out there in his youth group and in his school, right? And so we have that play on words. Uh, you know, referring to the, to the word hot, one of my favorite plays on words uh, is a billboard that's halfway between here and Canton. And um, this, is, this isn't the actual beer boy. This is just one that's, that's similar to it. But it says, your wife is hot, right? Now, when I say that about my wife, I'm talking about how attractive she is, how she is a good-looking lady. And that's why, well, that's one of the reasons why I married her, right? And so, you know, if you see that, you say, your wife is hot. But then this fine print, it says, better go get the AC fixed. And so there's a play on words there, right? Well, that's basically what Jesus is doing here, okay? He's not talking about cool or hot He's using the word Elohim. And so they basically said, those Pharisees said, you, a man, made yourself out to be Elohim. And then Jesus says, well, in Psalm chapter 82, it says that you are all Elohims. So why are you getting on to me? Why are you, you know, trying to kill me because I said that I'm Elohim, a son of Elohim, whenever the scripture itself says that we're all Elohims. Well, that's the kind of the play on words. And so what Elohim means in the Old Testament is it can mean God, but it also means judges. And in Psalm chapter 82, verse 6, it talks about, uh, it tells us that we are all Elohims. We are judges, or the people that, that the psalm is referring to are judges. And so Jesus does this little play on words that kind of ties the Pharisees' hands, where they, it kind of takes their argument away from them. And so, no, God, Jesus was not saying here that we're all gods, even though we might try to make ourselves out to be gods at some point. He's using a little play on words. It's a play on words. To, they're using that word God and judge that comes from the same Hebrew word. And so he, he kind of gets out of that, that tangle, but then he begins talking about some of the proofs that he, uh, that he has given to prove that he is the son of God. And so that's this number two there in your outline. You are given reasons to believe the truth about Jesus. Okay, so Jesus kind of got out of their little attempt to trap him and tried to stone him. And then he begins talking about the reasons, the evidence for faith in him. So we are given reasons to believe the truth about Jesus. Have you ever heard somebody say that Christian faith is a blind faith? Now, I've, heard, I've heard that said before, you know, you, don't, you can't understand everything about Jesus or about the Bible or about uh, what it means to be a Christian. You just got to accept it in blind faith. Now, I've, heard, I've heard people talk about that. Well, I'm thankful that my Christian faith, at least, is not a blind faith. And I think anybody to do anything at all on blind faith would be a pretty big fool. That'd be a pretty foolish thing to do, Right. You know, just to have absolute blind faith, to have nothing to go on, but just to say, well, hey, that guy said it, so I'm going to go ahead and believe it. Well, that's not what Jesus wanted. He didn't want us to have a blind faith. He wanted to give us reasons to trust in, trust in him. And so every religion claims some sort of revelation, right? Every religion claims some sort of revelation, but Jesus backed his up. Um, this is a uh, kind of an example of this, kind of playing off of a, an article that uh, Brother David gave us from John Dixon. It says this, our religions claim some sort of revelation. Buddhism depends on the profound insights from Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, during his moment of enlightenment while meditating under a tree. Hinduism looks to the Vedas passed on to the first man at the dawn of time. Islam says that the angel Gabriel dictated to the prophet Muhammad the very words of God. Mormonism is based upon new revelation given by the angel Moroni, but only to Joseph Smith. And so all these religions, these world religions, have a claim of truth given to one person, and then that one person transfers that message to all the rest of his followers. Nobody else gets the revelation. Nobody else saw uh, Joseph Smith's angel. Nobody else was there to receive the, the message from uh, Allah to Muhammad. There was just one man who received a revelation, and then he passed it on. But Jesus is completely different. Jesus communicated a message 
not transferred from God to a man to the people, but he communicated the message as God, as God in the flesh. But he didn't just communicate it to one person so that that one person could then carry on the message. He communicated it to all the people, everybody that he came into contact with. And not only that, he also gave visible evidences along with that word that he was sharing. So he did perform miracles. He um, uh, healed people. He walked on water. He calmed storms. He did all kinds of different things in order to give evidence that he was who he was. And so um, that's why whenever uh, Paul is talking about in his uh, uh, letter to the Corinthians, he's talking about why these people should believe in Jesus. He says, For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, which is Peter, and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time, Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one born at the wrong time, he also appeared to me. And so what Paul is saying there, and what Jesus is saying here, whenever he says, hey, look at the works that I have done, he's saying, look, I'm not just wanting you to believe this because of the words that come out of my mouth. You know, Paul is saying, I want you to go talk to the other people. Go talk to people who have seen Jesus after he was crucified and after he was buried. They saw him alive. He appeared to Peter. He appeared to the 12 apostles. He appeared to James. He appeared to Paul. But only that, he appeared to 500 people all at once. You know, because Peter might can make it up or James might can make it up or the 12 disciples could get together in a little powwow and make that up or Paul could have even made that up. But if you go to a group of 500 people and Jesus appears to them all at once and all their stories match up and you go to each one individually and they all tell you the same story, that's what we call a lot of credible witnesses. And in a court of law, that many witnesses could get you a verdict one way or the other without a doubt. And so this is verifiable evidence. The the central claims of Jesus have verifiable evidence. And so what exactly is this evidence? Well, Jesus gives us three different kinds. The first one is uh, the words of Jesus. Jesus gave us the words that he spoke, those words that he shared. It's funny that the Jews there in Jerusalem says, Jesus, tell us plainly, are you the Messiah? (laughs) Are you the Messiah? And Jesus said, I already told you and you didn't believe. It's kind of like whenever, uh, you know, you you tell your kids you're going to go do something and then they ask you over and over and over if you're going to do it. And you're like, look, I already told you that we're, you know, going to grandma's house. I already told you we're going to the store today. You don't have to ask me five times. We're still going to do it. Um, You know, some of our kids, we don't tell them if we're about to do something fun because we know that we will hear about it every single day, at least about four or five times. Are we still going to go do this? What time are we going to go do this? We don't tell them what time we're leaving to go to grandma's house because they'll be giving us a countdown. Hey, dad, it's 10 o'clock. We've got two hours. Hey, dad, it's 11 o'clock. We've got one hour. Dad, it's 1130. We've got 30 minutes. Are you ready? You know, we get that countdown. And we want them just to say, look, we told you that we're going to do it. Just believe us, and we're going to do it. And that's what Jesus is basically saying to these Jewish people. They're saying, hey, give us another sign. Tell us again. And Jesus is saying, look, I've already told you, and you didn't believe me. And so Jesus says to his own disciples in John 14, 10 through 11, he says, don't you believe that I'm the Father, and the Father is in me? These words I speak to you, I do not speak on my own. The Father who lives in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. So Jesus pointed to these claims as evidence of his deity. And in John chapter 8, the Pharisees questioned whether the fact that Jesus was his own witness, whether that was a valid witness. And Jesus' response was that his testimony was valid because of who he was and that also God the Father testified about him too. Do you all remember that? Whenever Jesus was baptized, he came out of the water, a Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove and a voice from heaven said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And so he had already had the testimony of the Father to verify who he was too. C.S. Lewis wrote this about the claims of Jesus compared to other major religions. He said, if you had gone to Buddha and asked him, are you the son of Brahma? He would have said, my son, you are still in the veil of illusion. If you had gone to Socrates and asked, are you Zeus? He would have laughed at you. 
If you had gone to Muhammad and asked, are you Allah? He would first have torn his clothes and then cut off your head. If you had asked Confucius, are you heaven? I think he would have probably replied, remarks which are not in accordance with nature are in bad taste. And C.S. Lewis continues, the idea of a great moral teacher saying what Christ said is out of the question. In my opinion, the only person who can say that sort of thing is either God or a complete lunatic. We may note in passing that he was never regarded as a mere moral teacher. He did not produce that effect on any of the people who actually met him. He produced mainly three effects, hatred, terror, and adoration. There was no trace of people expressing mild approval. I want you to think about that, that statement there by C.S. Lewis. You know, in our culture today, <clears throat> more and more and more, people want to consider Jesus a good teacher. He was a good moral teacher. He gave us some good life lessons, some ways to live in order to live a good moral life. But if you look at the New Testament record, nobody considered him to, to be a good moral teacher. There was one group of people that thought he was God. There was one, people, one group of people who thought he was the furthest thing from God. One group of people followed him and worshipped him as God. Another group of people tried to kill him and execute him because he claimed to be God. There was nobody in the middle. You were either for him or against him. And he even said that. You're either for me or you're against me. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot be in the middle. You can't put your hand to the plow and then look back. You're either for me or against me. So he had the evidence of his words. The second evidence was the works of Jesus. In John chapter 14, again, Jesus said, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. That really uh, mirrors what he said uh, here in John chapter 10. He said, if I'm, uh, if I'm not doing my Father's works, don't believe me. But if I am doing them and you don't believe me, believe the works. So in other words, those works that Jesus did were supposed to point to who he was. I mean, think about it. Only God can control the weather. Only God can read the minds of men. Only God could take a McDonald's combo meal and feed 5,000 men plus their families. Jesus did all of these things and more in full view of multitudes of people. And so his works pointed clearly to who he was. And these works also reveal the third bit of evidence, which is the power of Jesus. The third evidence is the power of Jesus. Of Jesus, Because like I said, only these, these things that Jesus did could only be done by God himself. And you know, one of the things that's really interesting here in this passage is that they pick up stones to try to kill Jesus, and then he kind of talks them out of that. But then he says, I am the, in the Father, and the Father is in me. Basically, he's equating himself with Yahweh, with God the Father. And so it says they immediately tried to seize him again, but he eluded their grasp. <laughs> Now, I want you to think about this, okay? One guy in the center of a mob of people, and that mob of people decides, let's get him. Now, how many of you think you could get out of the center of that mob? You know, unless you're like the Hulk and you get really mad, or maybe you're Samson and you have a jawbone, you know, you're not going to get out of the center of that mob. I don't care what kind of action movie you're in. There comes a point where you get overpowered, right? Right? Well, I think it's really funny that Jesus here, not just here, but in other places throughout the Gospels, he gets the crowd all mad, and they try to grab him, and then the, and then the, the writer just says, and he eluded their grasp and, and left the city. <laughs> or he, uh, he escaped from the crowd. It doesn't give any details, but somehow Jesus has the power to get away from a mob. And I don't know if he just like vanished, you know, and all of a sudden he was gone, or if, uh, you know, he just sort of like started elbowing people and fought his way out of there. Uh, Brother David said whenever he thinks about it, he thinks of this movie. And we can't show a clip of the movie anymore. But uh, if you've ever seen uh, this X-Men movie where there's a, there's a scene where a guy named Quicksilver, uh, they're, they're, some of these X-Men are trying to get shot and he freezes time or he goes so fast that it looks like time's frozen and he starts moving the bullets here and there, you know, and redirecting all the bullets so that they don't hit anybody. And he, you know, eats some spaghetti along the way because he's going so fast he can do that kind of sort of thing. Brother David said he kind of pictures it that way. Maybe Jesus kind of froze time and just walked through the crowd, you know, or something like that on his way out. And then whenever he snapped his fingers back and everything started back in motion, he was gone. Who knows? 
He has the power. He's still God. He has the power to do those kind of things. But the main thing we need to realize is that the power of Jesus proves who he was. Um, John, in John chapter 20, it says this about Jesus' miracles. So Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these, these ones that they have written, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So we don't have all the miracles written, but these that have been written are written so that we may believe and have eternal life. And so we, by nature, have a tendency to reject the truth about Jesus. But thankfully, Jesus gave us reasons to believe that he is who he says he is. And because of those reasons, then we get to number three on our, our outline today. You are required to respond to the truth about Jesus. Jesus gave us more than enough evidence to believe he is who he says he is. And so you are required to respond to the truth about Jesus. You know, it was interesting that these uh, Jewish people that he was surrounded by, they chose to reject him, right? They picked up stones to try to kill him. And then after he said some other things, they tried to grab him, but he eluded their grasp. So they made their choice. They were required to make a choice, and they chose against Jesus. But did you notice the, at the end of this passage, you know, sometimes these little side notes we tend to ignore. But look at the bottom of this passage there in John chapter 10. In John chapter 10, uh, around verse 40, it says, Then they were trying again to seize him, but he eluded their grasp. So he departed again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing earlier, and he remained there. Many came to him and said, John never did a sign, but everything John said about this man was true, and many believed him there. And so in Jerusalem, they were rejecting Jesus, but across the Jordan, they were believing in him because of the signs and because of the things that he said. And so it shows both sides. You either reject Jesus or you believe in Jesus. You are required to respond to the truth about Jesus. One of my favorite books when it comes to evidence about Jesus is this book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. Um, back in the, the 80s and 90s, he wrote a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And then he wrote another book called New Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And I've, I've got both of those put together. They're about that thick. And then uh, he's come out with this new version that has even more stuff uh, about why you should believe Jesus is who he says he is, why you should believe the Bible, why you should believe, you know, all these different things about our faith. If you've ever wanted a book that can explain in detail evidence for why we believe what we believe, why our faith is not just a blind faith, I encourage you to go pick up this book. Um, there's, no, there's not another book as easy to read but with as much detail as this one. And I think you'll really be blessed by it. But evidence that demands a verdict is a good one to, to pick up. And so we are required to respond to this truth about Jesus. Jesus basically says, I am God here in the flesh. And he's calling them to believe me. They said, why don't you just tell us if you're the Messiah? And he said, look, I told you and you didn't believe me. I've, done, I've said words. I've done uh, works. I've done the works of the Lord, and I've shown the power of, of God in my life, and you still have not believed me. You know, if, we, if you think about this, it's kind of like a diagnosis for a, a medical condition. You know, imagine if you had a, a medical diagnosis, and uh, the, the doctor said, in 10 years, there is 100% chance that this medical condition is going to take your life, and whether it's cancer or something else. In 10 years, this medical condition will most definitely take your life. However, there's a pill that you can take today that is guaranteed to heal you from this disease, and it works 100% of the time. Now, would you take that pill? I think most of us would, right? But imagine if you said, if, if you responded this way, maybe, or I don't know, I'll think about it. Or how about I've got 10 years, I'll get to it at some point. <laughs> you know, sometimes that's, if we look at it from the standpoint of a medical condition, that'd be a pretty foolish thing to do, right? Now, you've got cancer, but you take this pill, you're healed today, you never have to think about it again. Well, anybody in their right mind would take that pill, right? They would be healed instantly. Well, Jesus is saying the same thing. Look, you are lost. You have no hope outside of relationship with me. I am the, the bread of life. I have come to seek and to save the lost. I have come that, that people can have life and have it in abundance. Whoever believes in me 
will have a, a, a well of living water welling up in, inside of them. Jesus said over and over and over that he was the pathway to having true, real, lasting, eternal life. Yet people continue to reject him. They said, well, maybe, or I'll think about it, or maybe I'll get to it one day. And people are still saying that today. They're saying, well, maybe. Or, you know, that religion thing is okay for some people, but it's not for me. Or I'm not quite certain I have enough evidence to believe. Or, you know what, I want to live my life right now, but I'll get to that part of my life one day. The problem is we're never guaranteed that one day. We've all been given a spiritual diagnosis. We've all been given a spiritual diagnosis that one day we will die, right? Remember that quote by Augustine? We have a propensity to sin and a necessity to die. One day, our life here on this earth will end, and our life in eternity, one way or another, will begin. And so maybe is the same thing as saying no. Let me think about it. It's the same thing as saying no. I'll get to it at some point. That's the same thing as saying no. Because anything other than yes to Jesus is a no to Jesus. There's no middle road. And so what I want to encourage you to do today is if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, is to do it today. Don't just think about it. Don't just put it off. Don't say you'll get to it one day. Accept Christ as your Savior today. Look, it doesn't matter what level of sin you think you've gotten yourself to, to where God would never even accept you. God can never forgive you for what you've done. Listen, God will forgive you for anything that you have ever done in your life. When Jesus went to the cross, he went to the cross for every sin that had ever been committed and every sin that will ever be committed. He died for everything that you could ever do, that you could ever think, that you could ever imagine. Christ has covered over that sin with the blood of his gracious sacrifice. And so if you've never given your life to Christ today, today is the day to do it. Don't put it off. You know, Paul wrote in Philippians chapter two this. He said, for this reason... God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I want you to understand clearly what that means. That means that there will come a day when every person who has ever lived, and from this point on, every person who ever will live is going to have a face-to-face encounter with Jesus, and they will absolutely bow their knee to Jesus and say, you are Lord, you are God. Every person that's ever lived, Muhammad will one day bow his knee to Jesus and say, you are Lord. The Buddha will one day bow his knee before Jesus and say, you are Lord. Adolf Hitler will one day bow his knee before Jesus and say, you are Lord. Everybody who has ever lived, every single one of us in this room will one day bow our knee before Jesus and say, you are Lord. The difference between people like Muhammad or Buddha or Hitler and hopefully most of us in this room, the difference between them and us is that most of you, I believe without a doubt, have already willingly done that. You've already willingly bowed your knee in your heart and you have said, you are Lord. You are my Savior. You are my God. I surrender my life to you. I ask for forgiveness of my sins, and I want a relationship with God. And so one of these days, whenever we're face-to-face with Jesus, we're going to fall on our knees and worship, and we're going to say, finally, I get to see you face-to-face. You are Lord. You are God. You are my Savior. But people who don't make that choice willingly this side of life are one day going to be forced to do it on the other side of life, and they're going to have tears in their eyes and understand the rejection of Christ And they're going to say, you were right. You are the Lord. You are God. And I completely missed it. And Jesus will say, depart from me. I never knew you. And so what I want to encourage you today is two things. First of all, if you've never given your life to Christ, don't say maybe today. Don't say let me think about it. Don't say I'll get to it. You'd be the first person down here whenever Gary and the praise team start singing this this morning. You'd be the first one down here to give your life to Christ 
to cry out saying, I've messed up in this area, in this area, in this area, and I need forgiveness. And Jesus will wipe away your sin. He will restore you to a relationship with the Father, and you will receive eternal life that starts now and will last forever. You'll have a relationship with God, your creator. And so some of you might need to do that today. For most of us in this room, what we need to realize is that we all have these kind of people in our life, that if they were to die today, they would be forced to acknowledge Jesus as Lord, not willingly, but by force. And they would spend an eternity separated from God. And so if people have that natural tendency to reject Christ, we need to have, because we are saved, we need to develop within us a natural tendency to want to share the gospel with them so that they can escape that eternity separated from God. So if you're a Christian today, then listen, I want to encourage you, first of all, analyze your own life and make sure that you are walking closely with the Lord. But then secondly, I want to encourage you to be passionate, a passionate witness to those folks around you so that we can hopefully, hopefully help save people from the fires of hell because those fires are real. And they're approaching, getting closer and closer every minute that we take a breath. And so, guys, I just want to encourage you this morning. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, then you have that magic pill. You have that pill that can save somebody from from sin and bring them to eternal life if you share the message of the gospel with them. And so as we have our invitation time, I'm just going to ask you, if you've never given your life to Christ, to make that decision today. I'd love to talk with you about that. If you are a Christian, I would like to ask you today to pray for your one. Pray for that person that you know in your life that needs to accept Christ as their Savior. Can you do that for me? Let's pray. Lord God, we, uh, we just come to you this morning. We ask that you will uh, remind us of your goodness, that you will help us to understand and uh, believe who you are and who you said that you are. Lord, I know that in this room, there's bound to be somebody who's never surrendered their life to you. Lord, they continue to walk in a a pattern of sin, and and it could be something that's just open rebellion running from you, or it could just be they're living a good life, but they've never really surrendered that life to you. And by the world's standards, they're just, they're a good person. But by your standards, they're still somebody who's lost and in need of salvation. Lord, I pray if there's anybody today who needs to give their life to you, to experience that new life that comes only in a relationship with Jesus, that they would do that today. And Lord, for those of us who know you as our Savior, Lord God, remind us of the joy of that moment of salvation. I pray that we would, we would know without a doubt uh, that we are your children. And because we're your children doesn't mean we get to just lay back and enjoy the, the blessings of relationship with God, but it means we've been given a mission, and that is to take the gospel to the world around us, to our neighbors, to our coworkers, our family, to the people in our community and outside our community, even to people around the world, whether we can go physically ourselves or whether we can just help to send others, our mission is to send the gospel to where it's needed the most. And so Lord, I pray that you would remind, that, uh, remind, remind us of that today. As we have this time of invitation, Lord, speak to our hearts and help us to respond. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand?